welcome to the first episode of See What You Don't See, the podcast where we bring neurodiversity to life. I'm your host, Rebecca Bentink, Social Sustainability and External Affairs Manager for UK and I CGA, and I am one of the leads for See What You Don't See, our neurodiversity affinity group. With me today are Caroline Buchanan and Anna Goliash. Caroline, what brings you here today on the pod? Hi Rebecca, thank you. So I actually I come from the sales background and I'm very interested in neurodiversity and mental health and having been privileged to be in both teams, both the affinity group for neurodiversity and co here with yourself Rebecca and on the find balance boost your mind pillar with Anna, part of the mental health wellbeing. Fab, thanks Caroline, that's great to have you here today. Anna, same, what brings you here today? Thanks, Rebecca. So in my role as wellbeing manager in the UK, I look after our Boost Wellbeing programme, as well as our mental health ally programme and host Smash the Stigma Mental Health Awareness trainings. And as Caroline just said, I lead the Boost Your Mind group, of which Caroline is, is one of the many passionate members. And basically, I'm really personally passionate about mental health, and I'm really keen to explore the links between mental health and neurodiversity to raise more awareness. Fantastic. So today we're going to be lifting the lid on neurodiversity and what it shares in common with mental health. So Caroline, what is neurodiversity? So neurodiversity is a condition where people have their brain processes differently. Um, For each person, the challenge um, that they may have, there's also another side of the coin where they have superpowers that are waiting to be unleashed. Some of the common neurodiverse conditions that you might have heard of are autism spectrum disorder, which is ASD. You might have heard of ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette's, epilepsy, traumatic brain injuries. There are many more and actually many coexist as well, meaning that people can have more than one condition at the same time. So what are the common kind of conceptions of these conditions? You know, what what do people think of when they hear epilepsy or ADHD? Uh, yes, yeah, so, well, th- there's so many, isn't there? So ADHD will be the naughty little schoolboy, when in fact there's so many other facets to ADHD. And in fact, it affects girls very differently to how it affects boys and in, and in adulthood as well. Tourette's, the fact that uh, people think that that many people swear with Tourette's, but in fact it's only a really small percentage of people that swear. There's so many more. Dyslexia is not just about spelling. There's just so many different myths around each of these conditions that just simply aren't true, or if they have an element of truth, it's a very small part of it. Why is it often the case that people don't share this? You know, they don't share this at the workplace, they don't really share it at school. Why do you think that is? There's a real fear attached to disclosing these conditions and a lot of it comes from those myths and those stigmas that we've just talked about. You know, um, I chatted to one of my colleagues that sits on the affinity group for neurodiversity with us ahead of coming to do this podcast and he talked to me about his story where he had joined the company and he thought he could keep it to himself and he thought he could keep it, you know, really hidden because he'd built some strategies. He'd been through school and university and he'd worked out what works for him and how he could do it. But very quickly in the work world, he realised that that wasn't the case and it was much more difficult. And he actually started to have that trauma related to how he'd felt as a young person, um, that feeling of stupid, not capable. He eventually reached out to occupational health and he got some support and he's now thriving in his role. And that's one of, you know, that's the difference. And that's one of the things we want to talk about today is about how that can really impact on your mental health. That link back to the trauma of childhood that feeling of not being able of not being capable of how you were treated as a young person when you nobody maybe understood the condition where actually this person is now able to thrive and that's fantastic you know because there's so many superpowers come with each of these conditions you know for somebody with ADHD they have a really creative brain there's so many different things they can do, they're action orientated, they can make things happen, they can think of so many things at the same time, but sometimes they might forget something or not, or have to really manage their diary closely because it's really difficult to keep on top of that. Awesome. And Anna, you must find that people will keep a lot to themselves as well. Yes, absolutely. And we quite often see this in, in, in relation then to, to mental health conditions. So quite often the pressures of hiding uh, masking in the workplace as Caroline just explained the the colleague who told us his story 
because he felt that he, you know, he, he had coped in the past and he didn't want to sort of reveal, it quickly actually turned into quite a lot of pressure. And it was exhausting as well. It's exhausting trying to, you know, trying to hide something from others and trying to be somebody else and can quickly lead to, you know, lowering your self-esteem if you're also finding yourself actually not coping so well and, you know, questioning, you know, what's wrong with me. And it's quite often that sometimes people haven't even figured out yet for themselves what actually works for them and what doesn't. And that can be quite hard as well because it could lead to, you know, low self-esteem and really impact their mental health. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. So what are the benefits of sharing then? There's a, obviously a multitude of benefits. So it's uh, like I just said, in scenarios where somebody, for example, hasn't even maybe figured out yet what works for them and, and you know, coping mechanisms, it's an opportunity to to maybe find out, share with others and, you know, and, and, and just get advice and tips on what might be working for your condition. But it's also the the impact on your mental health for not trying to be someone that you're not and not constantly hiding or masking and just being able to be yourself without the fear of being judged or being thought less of because you're not you know coping as well maybe as as others in, in the same situation and it's that opportunity to really to get the support that you need but how can you get that if you don't you know if you don't talk about it and don't share so, uh, yeah, it's hopefully only positive outcomes from sharing. I totally agree, Anna. It's really interesting, actually, isn't it? It's, it's if you can put those little coping strategies in place, if you can get that support that you need to deal with the, the challenges that come with each of these conditions, it unlocks all the awesomeness that you can bring. You know, there's, there's so many, we use the word superpowers, but that's because it's true. You know, there's so many superpowers that each of these conditions bring. And... Th- that's what makes somebody thrive at work. That's what then that allows them to really drive different things, to really have those efficiencies, to be the best that they can be because they've had a manager who's listened, they've had somebody that's understood, they've had some little strategies put in place and suddenly they can go off and they can achieve whatever they should be achieving and whatever they can do. And Caroline, you've mentioned managers. You know What can managers do? Isn't this just a lot of extra work for them? Yeah, well, you would think so, wouldn't you? But actually, it's not. It's a long game. You've got to think of it that way. So if you listen, if you start the conversation with somebody who works for you and you listen to them, understand what their needs are, understand what might work for them, when they can be at the best and when they maybe need some little bit of support, that then allows that person to thrive. And, you know, linking back to Anna's point earlier about mental health as well, more what we're here to talk about today. If you don't support someone and they're covering things and masking and hiding and having to work really, really hard. So my experience comes from when you're trying to, you, th- you think you're not able, you think that it must be something wrong with you. So you work extra doubly hard to try and make up for all those things and to overcompensate and make sure nobody finds out, you know, that, that whole... <laughs> Somebody will work out that I'm not as good at this as I thought I was because I'm trying, so for some reason I didn't remember this or I couldn't get my brain to function and just logically understand that to-do list. So I had to put all these extra things in place and all these different things. And that impacts on your mental health, that impacts on your self-esteem, that impacts on your performance, that impacts on your ability to do your job. And therefore, that manager who might have saved themselves a couple of one-to-ones at the beginning of this relationship, then has all this time they've got to spend managing poor performance, going through all the processes of that, which nobody likes, let's be honest. It's not nice for the manager, it's not nice for the person going through it. And actually that person could be thriving. And you know what, that then as a manager, how great would that, you should actually learn from that too. What if we did that with all the people that work for us? <laughs> you know, how do I help you be your best? What support do you need? And that's how we have people that thrive in our business, regardless. Thanks, Caroline. So, Anna, how do we just be better allies, whether it's for mental health and neurodiversity or both or more? Oh, thanks, Caroline. I think um, everything you've just said for managers really almost applies to colleagues as well, to all of us who want to be better allies. You know, we all should strive to learn more about each other. It will make us all better colleagues and better allies. And we really should all strive to learn how how would others like to be treated and not just assume that the way we think they want to be treated is is the right way. We should really all take care to educate ourselves and learn more 
about whether it's neurodiversity or whether it's mental health, really focus on the positives and understand those superpowers rather than the default, which is always focusing on sort of the negatives or the stereotypes that, Caroline, yet you explained right at the beginning of the podcast. And by doing so, we can all really help create that sort of safe space and inclusive environment where people will feel more confident in opening up about whatever it is that, you know, that is going on with them, whether that's a neurodiverse condition or whether it's a mental health issue. And we could all start calling these things out. So if we, you know, if we come across any moments in any situations at work or even in our personal lives where um, we come across people maybe talking about the negatives too much or talking about the stereotypes, we could, if we feel confident enough in that moment and if it's the right moment, we could challenge it. And, and, and actually say, you know, try and help others to learn more in this space. So really lots that we can all do. This isn't just for managers. It's really something for, for all of us. Um, recently, we launched our flexible uh, working policy. What does that mean for this? What does it help? It's just really inclusive, isn't it? It's just, it's it's there for everybody and for somebody who's neurodiverse and knows that there's certain times of the day perhaps where they're not at their best, where their brain's tired from the overwhelmed feeling of having to put that extra in and, you know, work or, you know, speaking on a, a knowledge of ADHD, you know, your brain's working 10 times faster. <laughs> there are times where flexible working will really, really make a difference. But I think the beauty of it is the inclusiveness of it. It's the fact that you don't even have to explain to everybody why you're flexible in, in your hours or, or where you are um, situated or what your needs are because everybody can ask for that and everybody can have that flexibility and that's real inclusiveness isn't it? I totally agree Caroline I think it's it's giving us all that permission doesn't it that to manage our diaries in the way that work for us and whether that's because you have a neurodiverse condition or whether that's because you have a mental health condition or whether that is because you are a carer or whether that is because you were a parent, whatever it might be, you don't have to reveal the reasons for why you're flexing your hours. It is just naturally there and like you say, naturally inclusive. So it really works, I think, to everybody's advantage. Thanks both. One last question before we wrap up today. Anna, where would we find more resources if we were curious about mental health and being an ally? Yes, thanks, Rebecca. Well, there's a wealth of information on our Boost intranet pages, which you can find on the Northern European intranet pages. There's information on our Smash the Stigma mental health awareness training. There's information on our mental health ally programme and um, how you can reach out to an ally to have a conversation or if you want to become a mental health ally and to support others more. So I'd really encourage everybody to check out as there's far too much there for me to mention it all, but loads, loads available on the internet. Fantastic. Always better to have more than less. And Caroline, same, if anyone's curious or might consider that maybe they do have a condition or just they know someone, a loved one or a friend or a family member, where can they go to find out more and maybe even chat to the team? Yeah, sure. So there's a few places there. Um, first of all, I'd bring you to our Yammer page, which is see what you don't see. And there we've um, searched, we've saved all of our resources, different knowledge decks about each of the conditions, about how to support them, how to understand a little bit more, how to start the conversation, how to understand a little bit more from somebody. And that's all there on our Yammer page, plus a place that you can share or ask questions. And we've also got our internet page on the inclusive pages at Mondelez and uh, that's See What You Don't See as well. Um, we also have a fabulous call that we do every month called Heads Together where everybody's welcome and you can come along and drop in and listen, learn, share, chat, whatever suits you. Um, and it's a really nice safe space to learn a little bit more about neurodiversity, ask some questions and, you know, seek to understand a little bit more. Because we think that's a really big part of how we change this culture and how we make it a much more inclusive place for anyone with neurodiversity. Thank you both. It's been fantastic. Uh, what a great first episode. If you want to learn more, please check out Yammer in general. Until next time, listeners, take care.